Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Johanna and I'm from the UN Innovation Network. And thank you for joining us for this webinar on Sludge, which is hosted by the UN Behavioral Science Group. Um, the Behavioral Science Group is a subgroup within the broader UN Innovation Network of people who are interested in exploring how behavioral science can help achieve the SDGs. And the group currently has over 300 members from 40 UN entities and it promotes awareness and exchange within the UN behavioral science community. Um, behavioral science, for those of you who are um, not familiar with the term yet, refers to an understanding of how people actually behave, how they make decisions, how they respond to programs and policies and incentives, um, and it's very much a focus on an evidence-based understanding. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that later, as well, of course, about sludge, which is a very new term in the field of behavioral science and is used to describe overly complicated processes that cost people um, money or time or just make life difficult in general. So think of something really quite unpleasant, um, maybe sticky. Think of something that you really don't want to be in contact with. Um, and yet sludge is part of our life all the time. Um, it's in our work processes, it's in our personal life, it's just sneaking in there and taking time and eating up our energy. Um, I am sure most of us have encountered sludge before, but let me just launch a quick poll to see if you have encountered any kind of process this week that you felt was too complicated, took more time, energy or frustrated you. I'm going to leave this up for a few seconds. I'm hoping that all of you will say no, but for some reason I don't expect that's going to happen. So five more seconds, take your pick. And here's the result. So 36% of you said there was a lot of sludge, 46% of you said yes, there was sludge. Uh, and there were six lucky people on this call for whom sludge was not a problem. So I think you are very lucky indeed. Whatever you're doing in life, you're doing it right. Um, so thanks for uh, answering that question. We're trying to make this webinar very interactive. So there'll be lots of opportunities to ask questions and answers throughout the session. Um, for that, we're kindly asking you to use the Q&A tool on Zoom. It is on the bottom of your screen um, and you can post any questions that you have in there and you can also upvote other people's questions. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Mary, um, who is the uh, lead of the UN Behavioral Sciences Group and an expert advisor on behavioral science at, UN, at the UN Innovation Network. Mary has extensive experience working with governments, uh, working with international organizations and working with the UN. She has advised many uh, UN entities on behavioral science and she's also a lecturer on behavioral sciences. So we're very lucky to have her lead this group for us and Mary has kindly agreed to host the session uh, with of course our guest Cass this morning. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen Good morning, Mary. Thanks for joining us. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Johanna. And thank you all for joining us today. It's really amazing to see so many of you here on a, on a early morning for many of you. Um, so as Johanna mentioned, I'm the lead of the UN Behavioral Science Group. Uh, for those of you who haven't joined the group yet and you're interested in joining, hopefully you can. We'll pop the link uh, to the group in the chat at some point so you can keep engaged in our discussions as we go. As Johanna mentioned, we have a diverse group across 40 entities in 60 countries, and it's a growing group as well. So, um, so looking forward to having people with us. So for today's webinar, the content, uh, we're very fortunate to have a guest with us who I think needs very little introduction to many people who've joined us on the call today, Professor Cass Sunstein. He's the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard. He's also the founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy at Harvard Law School. So though Cass is a very prolific academic author, he's also a bit of an untraditional academic in many ways. Uh, one in that he's worked in practice quite a bit. So he's been able to look at some of the nuances of research and where it really intersects with the real world. So some of his work in this area just includes from 2009, 2012, he was the administrator of the White House and Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. He's also worked with a number of organizations such as the World Bank, the European Commission, and most recently the WHO. And lastly, you may also recognize Cass from um, 
from his books. He's quite a quite a productive author as well. I uh, won't name all of them here. Uh, just one that you might want to check out because it is his most recent. It's called Too Much Information. It's uh, I would definitely recommend it if you haven't read it already. Um, another one which you might be familiar with is Nudge. Uh, uh, improving decisions about health, wealth, and happiness, which I think many of you have read. So with that, thank you so much, Cass, for joining us. We're very, uh, very thankful and appreciative of your time. Um, so let's just kick it off and get to our discussion about Sledge today. So in more of a general sense, um, what is Sledge and, and why is it important? Thank you. It's an honor to be able to speak to you all. Uh, uh, sledge is uh, a little like love not in the sense that it's wonderful, but in the sense that one understands when one is experiencing it, but definition is sometimes challenging. Uh, if we want an entry point, sledges consists of frictions that separate people from something that they want. Uh, typically, sludge is not about money, though it may impose costs. Uh, administrative burdens are sludge. Uh, forms that you have to fill out are sludge. Waiting time that you have to experience is sludge. Travel time is sludge. And if you think of such issues as uh, getting vaccinated or being able to vote or being able to get health benefits or being able to get uh, economic assistance under very difficult conditions or being able to make a complaint in a situation where discrimination or violence has occurred, sludge is often the wall that stands between people and a desirable outcome. Very interesting. Those are some really compelling examples. I think across the UN system, we can we can relate to, especially I'm coming from a health background, those travel costs and all these frictions when it comes to filling out forms and vaccination definitely, definitely resonates. So orienting ourselves to now that we kind of have a general sense of what sludge is and how do we address it? So um, some questions around that are just where can we often find sludge and why does it occur in the first place? Okay, so uh, when I worked for the US government, uh, we did an annual sludge audit. It wasn't called that, but it basically was that, where we asked every institution of the US government to compile uh, an account of the paperwork burdens it imposes on citizens. So the Department of Energy imposes burdens on people who work for energy companies, on uh, customers, the Department of Education or ministries impose burdens on students and teachers and administrators. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services imposes burdens on uh, doctors and nurses and patients. And we ask them all on an annual basis to come up with a number that is realistic. And the total number, I hope everyone's sitting down, is 11 billion hours. Now that's an abstraction, but those 11 billion hours mean that nurses, instead of helping patients in context of let's say cancer or heart disease, are filling out governmentally mandated forms. Or patients, instead of trying to get help, are struggling with waiting time and documents that are often extremely difficult, especially for people who are poorly educated or poor or elderly or facing depression or some sort of uh, physical ailment. Now, the first step toward sludge reduction is to do some kind of audit so that you have an account of what's happening. And that can be with respect to something small in a little institution, uh, informal. You can just canvas people. They might be employees. We did a little sludge audit just now, asking people a, a lot or a little or nothing. That is uh, a, a tiny sludge audit. You can do it by asking people how much of the last month roughly have you spent on administrative burdens or waiting time or clearance processes. And you can ask people, and that can be uh, informal, or you can do something more technical and quantitative and come up with numbers. That's the first step. In the White House, we took a second step, which is to tell the big sludge producers, you have to make significant reductions. That was the President of the United States who said that, and we ended up getting much larger reductions than the President actually mandated, because the very notion of sludge and sludge reduction concentrates the human mind. And as a result, we were able to eliminate hundreds of millions of hours in paperwork burdens. Now that's not nearly enough, but that's an entry point. Especially if we're thinking about something that matters, it might be 
um, you know, something involving clean water or clean air or health or equality or poverty reduction uh, to focus on how much sludge is there in a very concrete setting and what to ask what steps will be taken in the next six months to reduce it. Mm -hmm. That is uh, an avenue for uh, shockingly um, beneficial change. Very interesting. So I'm curious in this, in this U.S. example, what were the areas, what were these high sludge areas that you were able to tackle and how did they do it to achieve the success that you're speaking Great. Of? Thank you for that. And I'll tell some stories out of school. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services in the United States, as in many, many nations, imposes lots of sludge, partly as a condition for receipt of money, partly as a way of guaranteeing or increasing the likelihood of good outcomes. And we asked the department to uh, work hard to identify administrative burdens and paperwork requirements, which were either not justified in the first instance, it turned out, or which on scrutiny are no longer justified. Telemedicine, by the way, was one example. There were severe restrictions on telemedicine, and they didn't make sense under modern conditions. There are also requirements for nurses and doctors in terms of forms to fill out or meetings to attend or training sessions. And once we asked the department to think very hard within a specific period about what they could do to reduce it, they figured out the equivalent of a billion annual dollars in paperwork requirements, a billion annually. And they said, we don't really need any of this. And they got rid of it. Um, truckers, I'll give a second example. Truckers in this country, the United States, as in many countries, are required to do things to make sure that they're complying with safety and other requirements. Turns out the truckers are required both when they close business at the end of the evening to fill out a bunch of forms to establish safety and rest and such, and then the next morning to fill out the same forms. But all they did between the night and the morning was sleep. So to fill out the forms twice made no sense. So we said, you don't have to fill out the second form. And that was a very significant uh, help. Here's another thing, uh, poor children are required, their parents to fill out certain forms to qualify for free school meals. And now we're talking about something that really uh, affects people's uh, health and their economic situation in a very significant way. Mm -hmm. Significant number of parents don't fill out the forms, they're complicated and they're, these are poor families and they don't have a lot of time and often not a lot of education. They get scared by a form and this is a problem I've observed in many, many nations. What, what we did was we just eliminated the sludge. We didn't reduce it. We said, if the school knows the, the child is poor or if the locality knows the child is poor, they don't have to fill out the form at all. They're automatically qualified. There are 15 million children in the United States who are now benefiting from this sludge reduction program. And that's not just about taking time uh, and giving it to people. It's about giving people access to a program that can turn people's lives around. No, that's, that's a very compelling point. It's not just about the process of solving, it would actually have that huge impact and change um, in terms of access to programs as well. Okay, so gearing us back, shifting us back to the UN context, um, uh, thinking about the work of the UN and the SDGs in particular, so programmatic work. So a number of in colleagues on the call today are coming from areas such as gender, education, health, and environment in particular. What are some ways that you see in these, these programmatic areas you think sledge reduction could be, could be useful? So what I'd wonder is in the domain of education, let's start there, uh, what kind of sludge are students, teachers, prospective trainees, and administrators experiencing? And uh, you know, the, uh, the sense of people who are working in these domains is that the volume of sludge is much higher than anyone intended. So for a teacher to get through a month without bearing administrative burdens that are excessive is very unusual. For students who are attempting, let's say, to get educational opportunity to which they're entitled, often they have to do things that students who are struggling with multiple demands on their time don't have time to do. And the fact that they don't get the educational opportunity to which they have a right 
is often a product of sludge. So financial aid forms in this country, the United States, and uh, forgive me for talking uh, locally, the financial aid forms have uh, a, such a degree of complexity that many poor people who are entitled to assistance to get higher education, they just give up. And the effect of reducing sludge in the forms is equivalent to reducing, to increasing the subsidy by 2,000 euros. So the effect, the impact. So education to have some kind of sludge on it and think what can be taken away and it, it opens up educational opportunity. For gender, I want to be very specific about what the problem of inequality is and whether it's a domain where uh, sludge is contributing the problem of inequality. It's the case that women are typically disproportionately the bearers of sludge burdens. That is, if there are administrative burdens on a household, uh, women in the family typically spend most time on it. And if it's about child care sludge, or if it's about uh, struggling against sex discrimination in the workplace, is it easy or is it really hard to point out that something wrong is happening? In the most searing cases involving domestic violence, uh, what do women have to go through to draw uh, attention to the problem from the public authorities? Often simplification of the burden that victims of sexual vi violence bear is the, uh, the best step that can possibly be taken to reduce the incidence of domestic violence because then perpetrators know that they, they don't have a green light or a license. The authorities will indeed uh, attend to them and that is a good deterrent. All great examples, and I think you know our colleagues at UN, UN Women would be happy to hear about the gender example. I think there's been some work exploring um, bystanders and how we can make the reporting from a bystander point of view more behaviorally informed and, and easier. So thank you for your examples. Okay, now gearing us towards uh, the actual institutions of the UN, how can the UN reduce sludge in, in the institutions, and what tips or starting points would you offer the UN in thinking about thinking about this? Okay, so my own experience with the UN, which has been completely inspiring, uh, has uh, pointed to the existence of a solvable problem, which is that often internally there are clearance processes and uh, box checking mandates that for which less would be more. And uh, what's true of the United Nations <clears throat> is true of Germany and France and uh, Mexico and the United States and the United Kingdom, that internal government processes typically not through anything other than accretion or lawyerly carefulness uh, often have checkpoints that are far more numerous than is uh, optimal. So to think, to get something done that would actually deliver benefits for a, nation, a partner nation or for citizens there, uh, how can we reduce the number of checkpoints or the burdens in terms of time? I, I, I had a very long discussion with a uh, uh, head of a cabinet, one of the President Trump's uh, cabinets, uh, a very high level official who, uh, and on this count, I worked for President Obama on this count, there was no difference between the Obama and the Trump people. He said what he noticed when he got his job was the number of things that had to be done for his department actually to help people was excessive. And uh, that a, uh, a careful check of whether each step in the process actually is a good idea uh, creates momentum for change. If there's either bottom-up leadership, which is pointing this out, or top-down mandates, which is saying we have to make this work faster, um, that, that can help. 
And I would defer to you all with respect to particular choke points or excessive sludge at the UN, but I've heard from many who work there that the extraordinary work being done every day would be at least 10% more productive if sludge were reduced even by 5%. Yes, yes I, can, I can testify to some of these experiences in the UN system. It's been, uh, yeah, so there are definitely lots of challenges and I think um, there was actually a competition a few uh, last week regarding ways the UN can improve, uh, sort of a dragon's den, and the winning idea actually was to use some digital ID to actually help UN colleagues in their, in their changing jobs. So again, lots of issues here that have been flagged previously, but kind of sludge can help give us that, that language and understanding to, to move it forward um, in a way that's, that's truly meaningful. Okay, so I see we have lots of questions coming in. I think I'm gonna get to some from our colleagues here. Um, let me just, can pull up here. So we have one from Stephen Slosky. I'm not sure which entity he's from, but he said in the UN, sludge is often perceived as a mechanism to reduce risk. How do we reduce sludge without reducing the risk? The trade-off. Okay, great. Um, so we need to know a risk of what. Um, uh, let me give an example to concretize it, which I, th I think will resonate. Uh, uh, one of the best anti-poverty programs in many countries is, is goes by the name of the Earned Income Tax Credit. It might be familiar, where working poor get an economic benefit, which makes them less poor. Uh, the take-up rate in this country for the Earned Income Tax Credit, credit is about 80%. That's unusually high for a benefits program. Usually it's around 40 to 60%. But 80% means that over a million people aren't getting a benefit to which they're entitled, which has long-term health effects and educational benefits as well as economic benefits. Um, here's what could be done to knock that 80% up to 100%. Uh, the Internal Revenue Revenue Service, the tax authorities know who is qualified. The, they could just say, we know you're qualified, you're in. That would get 100% like that. Uh, the problem, as the question suggests, is that the IRS, if the Internal Revenue Service did that, it would make some mistakes. It would give the benefits to some people who aren't legally entitled to them. It doesn't have perfect proxies for poverty. And sometimes sludge is, ne is necessary to reduce the risk to program integrity. That's often the uh, founding value, let's say, for programs, program integrity. Um, uh, I think the right way to think about program integrity as a value and a risk to it is a trade-off between uh, ensuring through sludge that eligibles won't get benefits while also ensuring through sludge that ineligibles won't get benefits. And the trade-off should in the first instance depend on the numbers. So if you have a program by which two people get benefits who aren't entitled and 5 million get benefits who are entitled, that's probably worthwhile. Where my, my, my crowd, that is the lawyers, are often extremely nervous about the risk to program integrity. That's correct nervousness, but it shouldn't turn into paralyzing anxiety if the numbers look like what's been described. So to do a kind of an analysis of the magnitude of the risk posed by sludge reduction and the magnitude of the benefit posed by sludge reduction and then just do a comparison. Now it might be there'll be some hard value choices like if you ensure through sludge reduction, let's say in a clearance process, that there is a heightened risk that a document will go out of the UN that hasn't been uh, tested by 12 people, but instead only by seven. Uh, it might be that that's a reason not to reduce the sludge, that you need those additional five. But to focus very um, uh, earnestly uh, and also with a smile on whether the risk is sufficiently large that it justifies the adverse effect of sludge. So what we found in the United States government with at least one sludge reduction exercise is that hundreds of millions of hours in sludge really was not on balance warranted by risk reduction. And I've been hopeful that the Trump administration would go hard at sludge. Uh, to my surprise, it, it hasn't. I think they've had other things that they focused on, but I'm hopeful that the Biden administration will go hard at sludge. And if it does, it will discover that uh, risks are often uh, real, 
but as a, an obstacle to sludge reduction, they're more an excuse than a justification. Thank you. For, that's a very helpful um, overview there. And it looks like you've, you've addressed one of the questions from Wasim from the UN Foundation, who actually kind of used this similar terminology. He was asking, um, so is sludge there to slow down decision making and stop policy in the lurch? And in the end, is sludge just a good cost benefit analysis? So. I think that's, that's beautifully put. So what we need is a cost benefit analysis of sludge. Clearly. And often in governments with which I'm familiar, at least, the benefit of sludge is, um, is uh, attended to, but its cost is disregarded. And if we want to get a little behavioral for a moment, uh, even if people are completely rational in deciding whether to navigate sludge, it may be too costly to be worth the burden. Uh, but people aren't completely rational. They procrastinate. They suffer from inertia. Uh, they often give up. They have scarcity of attention, especially people who are busy employees at the UN. You all know much better than I do. But you've got a lot to do. And an administrative burden might prevent doing things that are actually more important, or it might be something that just won't be uh, attended to. And for that reason, some people won't get you know, employees won't get benefits. They may be savings benefits. They may be uh, benefits that bear on their health. They won't ever get them because they're busy on other things. So I, I love the way it's described to do a very careful and objective cost benefit analysis of sludge is uh, an excellent uh, uh, way into the problem. Mm -hmm. Definitely, as so when you can put some numbers behind it, it can make all the difference when you're when you're presenting your your, your arguments and what you would like. Um, so, next question here is from Gloria Georgia from the ILO. Uh, she'd like to know what kind of diagnostic or design methods you used in your sludge audit, sort of the more the how you did that um, to map the process, you identify the pain points, reduce the steps. Just speak a bit more of the process you undertook to, to get at that. Thanks. Okay, so this is a fantastic question, partly because sludge reduction and sludge audits are like a, a little child. That is, we're talking about a creature that's yet to reach teenage years. So in uh, the governments with which I'm familiar, the, I, the first idea is to ask particular entities to quantify to the extent that they can the existence of sludge. And if they can't do that, to speak in qualitative terms. Then to ask people who are affected by sludge, whether they're employees at an institution like the UN or uh, people who are ad adversely affected by sludge, who may be officials in other countries or citizens, to ask them to the extent that they can to uh, comment on the adverse effects of uh, sludge. And within the Department of Transportation, there were people who were saying, look, these burdens we're imposing on truckers, they're probably not justified. And even more informatively, truckers said, and organizations representing them, this isn't justified at all. And in the case of uh, healthcare, outside researchers said, look, the cost of healthcare in many countries is um, much higher than it would otherwise be because of paperwork and administrative burdens. So to reach externally to slight stakeholders can be a way to do it. The identification of pain points uh, is often uh, facilitated just by asking people and frequently an idea that's uh, low hanging fruit will, will emerge. Uh, I'm very conscious uh, in light of the question that the sludge audit could itself be a form of sludge, which would raise uh, metaphysical questions as well as be self-defeating. So I would think that a good way to start would be to be um, uh, have a sense of urgency and a sense of uh, asking people who are facing it in entities at the UN and with uh, partner countries who are uh, trying to get a program off the ground and struggling because there's lawyer generated or good faith generated sludge that's, uh, that's working as an obstacle. All, all very great points to think about as we, as we sort of expand upon this concept of the sludge audit and what it means in the UN context more broadly. 
Um, so another question from Georgia actually from the ILO was in, more again in, in your practice and guess in your US context, uh, what resistance um, did you face into reducing the sledge? If people oftentimes lose ownership of forms, they felt protected of, they feel protected of them. Um, how did you overcome this? What kind of convincing did you do? Did you have the decision-making power? I know you spoke a bit about the bottom up and the top down previously, but um, maybe some more about that would be helpful. Okay, so that's a fantastic question. And there are a, a few things that both in my experience and the experience of others I've seen work. Um, a number of years ago, there were light bulb jokes. I don't know if these are familiar and they were hardly ever funny. It was like, how many basketball players does it take to change a light bulb? And the only funny one was this, I think. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is one, but the light bulb has to want to change. And so one route for sludge reduction is to find partners who either already want to reduce sludge or who get immediately excited about the idea or who can be convinced kind of that the idea is already theirs. So if uh, leaders at the UN or elsewhere, uh, if their eyes light up at the very concept, then they're automatically uh, an ally. And I saw in parts of the US government, people who were resistant, uh, but there were other people who were excited and to work with them is, is very good. Um, I had President Obama personally behind the effort. So I was uh, blessed to be able to say, President is ordering this. And he actually did in a document and the document he actually helped write. So that made it uh, more, you know, more like a, an order than a, a, a plea. But the, those are the two main routes to find excited partners. And if you can't find partners, just to give a quick description with either stories or numbers of something like the poll initially done here, that was a stunning result. Within the last week, the vast majority of people said they've encountered excessive administrative burdens. And the very term sludge I found um, it's a little bit funny, meaning it makes people um, laugh a little bit, and it's it captures all of our experience. The very term often is uh, an, an energizer. You know, I think those are all very great points and very helpful and practical for us to think about. Um, if you don't mind, I might push a little bit on one of the things there. So I like the idea of having a case study and showing that it can work, and it can work not only outside, but in the US government or in the UN or somewhere else that's always relevant. I found with this is more extrapolating to behavioral science, but um, it's oftentimes easy to convince people who are very senior, people who are relatively in the bottom up, but it's really challenging at times. I find that middle layer of the bureaucracy. Do you have any, and this is maybe a bit of a too specific question, but if there are any tips you have for that of ways you can talk about reducing sledge for those people who are perhaps a bit more risk averse than let's say the other, other parts of government? Yeah, so so I'll tell you what what I did. This anecdotes don't tell you a whole lot, but maybe this will be relevant. Uh, we had one department that was extremely reluctant to do anything, and they thought we built up this over a period of years. Everything we did was for a good reason, and uh, to take it away would be to compromise some value. So I went over there physically. I you know I didn't call anybody up. I went over from the White House to the department and I was humble and I, I asked them, you know, what's what's out there, what are its effects, what's its justification. And if you're meeting people face to face, even on Zoom, it has a it breeds commonality. So they they were intelligent and good people and everything they said was uh, founded on something. But as we talked, I could see them saying, well, maybe this one we can get rid of. This one was adopted six years ago and you know it's okay, but is, is it that useful? Maybe not, maybe we can get rid of this one. And the face-to-face -face interaction among people who are treating each other with dignity and respect uh, can help. 
I'll, I'll tell one more story, which is that early on in the White House, I, I had a meeting about, um, I called a meeting about how to take away barriers to uh, development projects so that they could be faster and promote economic growth. And the meeting, which was the mid-level people you describe, uh, it occurred to me that their entire presentation was about uh, why all of the obstacles to development projects were a good idea. It was surreal. And so I, I said with, um, you know, uh, with a, a sense of mischief, I said, the point of the meeting is, is not to defend every existing barrier. The purpose of the meeting is to figure out how we can take away at least some. And everybody laughed. And, and then they focused on what they could do to reduce the barriers. And the mid-level people, they know things probably that no one else knows, so they might be right. But if, if they have a project, uh, you know, if you say, if the structure of the universe is going to collapse unless we take away at least 5% of sludge in the next year, what would we do? And they'll figure out something. Very interesting ways of framing the framing all of that. Um, so I, I'd like to ask a follow-on question from Kat from DCO. So she's works more centrally in terms of the way the UN functions. Um, she asked a question which uh, builds upon it. So how do you how would you advise teams to evaluate to reduce sludge when they have a stake in actually keeping it in themselves? If say um, it's the way the, the, the next question addresses a bit. It's, it's as well in terms of if their job depends on it, if their role is important for the sludge to be there. How do you have these sorts of discussions? Right. It's a little like the, the light bulb has to want to change. Yeah. So, so if they can get excited about, if they can develop a stake in taking it away. Now, in the abstract, you can say that in the abstract, how to make it so. Uh, I saw people who were mid-level people, you know, amazing people who spend uh, 20 years on programs uh, get really excited about sludge reduction once they had a sense of ownership. So if, if they're gonna lose their job, if sludge is taken away, that's, that's hard for them to get excited about. So maybe to think that their job description would be different or broader or part of their job description would be uh, simplification. So I, I should say I was in uh, Argentina not terribly long ago, and uh, they have a very strong program for sludge reduction. And uh, some of the mid-level people, that became a part of their job and their self-understanding. So, so if they can see it helping their colleagues or uh, citizens, uh, I'm, I'm smiling because they have something that I think is very unusual, which is the you can get your driver's license on your on your cell phone. That's your driver's license right on your cell phone, and uh, the the people who did that were so excited about it, though they were initially resistant. So a, a little bit to think that uh, that's something that they are doing, that the UN is doing, that they can be pioneers in that this entity can do something better than anyone else? That's a great way to frame it. I mean, which entity is gonna be the best at sludge reduction? Let's, let's uh, have some discussions around that. Um, okay, next we have a question from Rana. I'm not sure where she's from, which entity she's from, but um, building off some of the previous discussions. So how can we minimize sludge related to oversight and audit compliance functions without actually compromising the function? Right. So um, uh, there are kind of off the rack ways uh, that might work. Uh, electronic rather than paperwork. Um, uh, annual rather than quarterly. Um, uh, Pre-filled uh, forms with respect to things that are repeated. Uh, you know, not things that are part of the audit function, but names and location and identifier things. Uh, so there are maybe six things, I just had three of them, that can basically allow the same oversight and audit, but minimize the, the burden. Uh, it may be that the level of sludge is optimal with respect to some oversight and auditing functions, in which case the consequence of, let's say, a quick sludge audit is to say it's not broken. 
but uh, in many domains, auditing just involves uh, uh, steps, internal steps that could be cut by somewhere between five and 40% that would not compromise. And you, you, it's hard to know what should be reduced without knowing what the actual steps are. Um, but the thought is to have some scrutiny of everything there and to think, is this really necessary for the audit? Um, my, my hunch is uh, uh, excessive sludge will be uncovered typically. Yes, I think that might be an act pretty accurate hunch. Um, okay, so next we have a question from Ken, Ken Davis. Again, I'm not sure where he's from, but um, what do you think about mandating sludge reduction? Um, do you think it could have an unintended effect of simply pushing sludge off to other people outside the scope of measurement? Or do you think some knock-on effects or indirect effects of pushing for sludge? It could, but in the cases I know about, it hasn't. So the examples I gave just to ask doctors and nurses and hospital administrators to do less. They don't have to do what they had to do before. That doesn't... Uh, push the sludge off anywhere, it just disappears. It goes poof, it's magic. To say truckers, you don't have to fill out the form in the morning, just goes away. To take a form for educational uh, economic benefits for higher education, to have 100 questions reduced to 17, they just go away, it doesn't push anything off. Uh, to say that uh, people are automatically registered to vote. They don't have to sign up. It's, it's not pushing anything away. So uh, I'm, I bet you have, Ken, things in mind which confirm the wisdom of the question. And that's why I'm agreeing it could. But the, the, the simplest examples are ones where it just takes it away and there's no, there's no need. Um, if, if you, if for a permit or uh, a license, you can do it by mail rather than by going into the place. Or if you can talk to a doctor, you know, as the way we're doing, rather than going into the office, there isn't any pushing it outside the scope of measurement. It's gone. Interesting point. And perhaps going back to the behavioral science lens a bit, and we often think about sort of unintended consequences of what we're doing. So maybe in the sludge audit, as you, I'm just proposing this, as you, as you carry your sludge audit or the proposal, you think about these sorts of effects and think, is there potential to have a knock-on effect somewhere else? Will this pop up in government or, or in some other program? So, so I think it's a good point, Ken, we should be thinking about it, but as you're right, Cass, about it, it's not always there in a lot of the examples. Um, okay, cool. So next, Karen, uh, again, I'm not sure where you're from, but um, does sledger access paperwork requirements prevent fraud or corruption or facilitate it? So I'll give the lawyer answer because that's my that's my people. <laughs> um, that sludge and paperwork requirements are fraud and corruption preventing mechanisms. So the reason and this is connected with the great question about auditing and compliance, that having a lot of sludge is a way of ensuring that we're not having corruption uh, and preventing fraud. So sludge reduction is typically not uh, the preferred means of reducing fraud and corruption, though if the sludge is associated with fraud and corruption, of course it could do that. Um, the question is whether the level of fraud, uh, the level of sludge that we're now observing is necessary to prevent fraud and corruption. And uh, typically it is, at least in the countries with which I've worked, it's higher than is necessary. Um, it's justified rightly as a, uh, to prevent that, but you could cut it significantly and accomplish the same goal. This is the question points to, by the way, not just cost benefit analysis of sludge, which could be quantitative or more intuitive, but also cost effectiveness for sludge. So is, is this the most cost effective way of achieving the fraud reduction goal? And just asking that question might be might it might be self answering. No. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so I'm going to go down the questions a little bit, and one from Sarah Bay, who's um, I'm not sure where she's from as well, but she said you mentioned digital 
uh, the use of digital to reduce sludge. Do you have any views on how technology could be a catalyst to accelerate sludge reduction? Particularly has a question regarding blockchain, potentially could be interesting in this sense. Um, yeah, if you have any questions about, have any comments about digital aspects of sludge reduction? It's a fantastic uh, sludge reducer. So to say that people can file online if they have internet access, that's great. Uh, to say that things will be provided online, benefits and other things, uh, is uh, that increases often program integrity as well as uh, reducing sludge. Uh, to, to say that uh, if it can be done online, it will be done online, which can allow uh, pre-filled forms and that can make things much easier for people. Uh, blockchain, I feel I want to be agnostic on uh, pending more information, uh, but, but th this is the way of the future. Very, very interesting points. And I think another thing to maybe consider is, is access to internet and access to data as well. So I think if, if you take a more nuanced understanding of your context and the population you're dealing with, as well, we're talking about sludge and programming, not just um, in, not just within institutions. So I just want to acknowledge as well, Thomas uh, Krall, again, I don't know where you're from, but he had a similar question about sludge and digitization. So I just want to acknowledge that here. Okay. Because if no, so, sorry, go ahead. So about good practices. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so uh, many governments are moving with uh, speed, but maybe less speed than they should, towards saying that filing can be electronic or must be electronic, and that all interactions with uh, relevant officials will be electronic. Argentina, I gave the example of um, digital uh, driver's licenses. And uh, actually, I was in Argentina on the day, the week that it was announced, maybe even the day, and the demand was so high that the website crashed. Everyone wanted it, but that was fixed. But it is suggestive that the initiative was a really good idea. So I think with partner countries or inside the UN, are there areas where things aren't yet elect all electronic that really should be? And if the relevant population doesn't have internet access, then you might want to make um, you know, a more refined approach where, where that population, of course, wouldn't be digital. But that that is a terrific avenue from, for sludge reduction. Mm -hmm. Very good point. I think there's a lot of interest in that, especially with COVID, a lot of increase in digital products and apps. So I think this is what we need to be considering. Um, OK, so another question from Kat from DCO, again, the central uh, UN. Uh, can the sledge audit be, in, be done in-house or does it require an external independent audit team? Just some clarification there. On that question. It certainly can be in-house. So uh, the ones that are ongoing have all, I'm not aware of any external independent audit team that's coming, but, uh, and it might be better, but in-house you have the advantage it's cheaper. You don't have to uh, hire anybody. And it will have the expertise of people who are on the ground dealing with it. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a very fair point in terms of also, yeah, to that knowledge of the system and how things work and, and what how things go up and down the hierarchy and bureaucracy. Another question from Andre Spicat. Um, typically, when something goes wrong, the system responds by adding another checkpoint to prevent it from happening again. What could be suggested here as an alternative reaction um, to prevent this from occurring? Okay, it's great, uh, the, the hypothesis um, that uh, a natural human response to mistake is to add another layer. Um, notice, if you would, that in the context of COVID-19, we've seen uh, a series of battles against sludge. So, and they've often been bottom up where agencies have said, um, we're gonna get the benefits out in a much simpler way where maybe they'll just be wired into people's accounts, maybe they'll just be mailed, the forms won't, the ordinary forms won't be required, we'll dispense with the mandate of an in-person interview, waiting time will be cut by two thirds, um, 
uh, we will increase simplicity and automaticity. So for some things going wrong, it depends on what it is, the response is sludge reduction. If there's been a mistake in terms of program integrity, where benefits have gone out to someone or a document's gone out, uh, an additional checkpoint is a natural remedy. Uh, I think you're putting your finger on what is probably a heuristic in the behavioral sense that is a rule of thumb that is not senseless, but that leads in the kind of standard phrase to severe and systematic errors. Uh, we need to name this heuristic, which is uh, the ad sludge heuristic as a response to error. And the reason it's, it's, it's intuitive is the sense is we didn't have enough um, uh, clearance or enough security against mistake, let's add another. But that may be a cure that's worse than the disease, and it might be even, it might not be the right cure. So instead of adding another checkpoint to have uh, fortify, which is not to say sludgeify the existing checkpoints, meaning make sure that the person who was careless, let's say, isn't that person anymore, or if it's that person, make sure that person does her job. Interesting. Yeah, there are lots of different approaches you could take to take with that. Um, okay, so I have, we have another question from our colleague at ICAO. Um, several examples relate to providing the same information and duplicate to different people. Uh, this goes back to the lack of sharing of data. Uh, this is often restricted due to privacy, data protection rules or principles. Are such rules and principles an enemy of sludge reduction or how does use of data relate to what we're talking about? That's a fantastic question. So when, when I was in the White House, we actually did a guidance document on exactly this question mm -hmm. where the goal was to strike the right balance between privacy and data protection and uh, desirable information sharing. And it, th there isn't really an abstract answer, I don't think, except that uh, in some governments, uh, sharing of information is suboptimal and that privacy is used as, uh, uh, as not just an important consideration, which is occasionally decisive, but as a, uh, all, uh, but an all-purpose obstacle to salutary data sharing in circumstances in which the threat to privacy or data is is minimal. So um, uh, this is going to be crude, but uh, there are many institutions where uh, data sharing ought to be uh, more frequent than it now is, and that because of the risk to uh, privacy is insignificant. Hmm. Now, those are all yeah, very interesting questions and I think it's, it's comments we've heard across the UN system about data. Um, I, I hear there's some discussion in the chat about how to get started with sludge audits. Johanna, do you want to comment on, on that just because I haven't been able to follow it? Absolutely. Thanks for doing a great job hosting this discussion, Mary, and uh, thank you, Cass, for uh, so many insightful answers. Our colleague Ruth from the Young UN Network has uh, asked in the chat if anyone is interested in conducting a mini sludge audit um, to identify some ways where it exists, to learn from that. Um, so I really just wanted to point colleagues to that effort kicked off by Ruth. If you're interested in joining that, please drop us a line. And also, Cass, any recommendations on how we would start with this? Where, where does one start with the sludge audit? Okay, so to get people in the relevant unit, uh, to explore first what are the components of sludge in that unit and to get accounts that are qualitative about magnitude and then to see what can be done if feasible to turn those qualified qualitative accounts into upper and lower bounds with respect to ours and then to get clear on what are the components, what are the drivers of the hours, uh, and then to think hard about whether they're necessary. So the, the beauty of this is that as described, it has a degree of um, informality and simplicity itself. This is, this is not what the US government does in documenting actual hours. It's more uh, impressionistic, but something like that can be an avenue for change. I noticed one of the questions is about meeting overload. 
And it, that is, I think, reasonably undertaken as a form of sludge. I had a little sludge reduction strategy in the US government, which is any meeting that was my meeting would take 15 minutes. Those, the, those staff meetings had formerly taken an hour. I said they were going to take 15 minutes. And it was understood by all that if it needed more than 15 minutes, it would uh, get more than 15 minutes. But the idea was data-based, which is that typically an hour meeting becomes most productive in the last 15 or 20 minutes. And, uh, and uh, these, these were on concrete issues that didn't need that much time. And sometimes the, the anchor would be half an hour rather than 15 minutes. But to see that as part of the sludge audit, um, where there's, uh, there's a behavioral phenomenon called cumulative cost neglect, where if someone is spending, let's say, uh, five euros on something uh, 70 times in a short period, they will neglect the cumulative cost. And time is similar, cumulative cost neglect with respect to time. So that would be a reasonable part of a sludge audit. Fascinating, lots of ideas to explore, Ruth and colleagues. Happy to, happy to continue these discussions after this call. Um, Cass, if you don't mind staying a couple more minutes so we can go past the hour a little bit. We have just a few more questions in the chat. I mean, they're still coming in, but we'll answer as many as we can. Um, so there's a question here from Sasha, and it's about um, how do you respond to claims that behavioral interventions such as sled reduction shift short-term behavior, but don't actually move for long-term behavior and decision-making? Maybe that's a question of how we actually carry out the sled reduction. I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to respond. Okay, so if you uh, automatically enroll eligible children in free school meal programs, you have over a period of a decade, millions who are receiving the benefit to which they're entitled. If you take away the equivalent of roughly a billion euro in annual monetized time costs on nurses and doctors in 2012, then that happens every year up to the present. If truckers don't have to fill out that form uh, starting in some year, let's say 2016, then that's a, a long-term benefit. If employees, let's say at the UN, uh, are relieved of some administrative burden, then they can devote their time to something, let's say, that has greater urgency. That should be a, a, a long-term uh, benefit. So there are some nudge-like interventions like uh, information disclosure, which may wear off over time. People might start ignoring it. But the, the, the glory, let's say, of sludge reduction strategies is if they really work so that people who are trying to get, let's say, access to a doctor when they're sick, that it's, it's just easy for them, then they have, th then that's, that's permanent. Exactly. That, that's, that's very clear and I think makes the point quite, quite well. Um, so we also have another question for um, suggesting whether, whether a, sorry, a sledge reduction is worth it. So when it will lead to hitting or head against the wall. So maybe it's a bit of that cost benefit too. Is it worth the time, one project versus another? How would you go about thinking about that? Well, I'll say that um, it would depend on the context. Um, Okay, 11 billion annual hours in paperwork burdens are imposed by the United States government on the people of my country. Um, that has disproportionate adverse effects on people who are sick, people who are poor, women, and people who are old. If you can do to ask people who are you know, impaired in one or another way, to deal with things. It might be just they're really busy. That's the nature of their impairment. Uh, the potential payoff is very large. So th the context I'm familiar with, the, it, it hasn't been beating one's head against the wall. Not that easy, but in the sense that the payoff is very large and the probability of getting some of it is very high. Very high. So some of my former colleagues in the civil service, I've been working with them over the last years to try to get sludge reduction under President Trump 
And it's just been very hard for the White House to prioritize that given the range of things. But, it's, but it hasn't been as if people haven't agreed. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I say, I'm hopeful that uh, this can happen in many institutions. Uh, thank you for that. So I think I think this is our last question. Hopefully we can end on a bit of an optimistic note here. Um, how can we maintain sound evidence base in sludge reduced or, or sludge eliminated context? So as we build up this evidence base, and sludge is a relatively new idea in a lot of our circles. And how can we really remain evidence based while we do that and also maybe contribute to an evidence base in this area? Well, the the easiest metric is hours. So if there are you know thirty hours a week spent on something and that's reduced to 10 hours a week then we and we know that then we have evidence of the hour saving and as many of the questions rightly point out we want to know what's lost by those 20 hours and and maybe it's significant maybe there's an increase in error but maybe not and this too can be tested so for the earned income tax credit example i gave every example would be analyzed separately uh, the authorities at one point were clear. They had evidence that if they automatically gave people the earned income tax credit, they took the sludge away, they would get, they would increase uh, participation of eligibles to 100%. They knew that. But they also knew they would increase participation of ineligibles by a specified number. They had a lower and upper bound, suggesting that even at the upper bound, the number of ineligibles was much, much lower than the number of eligibles who would suddenly get benefit. And so they, they had the evidence. Then there'd be a value judgment whether the increased receipt by the ineligibles, even though there were many, would be so bad as to outweigh the increased receipt by the eligibles, which would be good. But this was an evidence-based assessment. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much, Cass, for your time and for sharing your responses to our questions. I do realize we're past the hour here, so thank you. Um, do you have any other things you want to add or share with the group before we before we log off? Yes. So um, I, I bet there's tr specialized terminology within the, the UN about that would be exotic to others, even if others who speak all languages. So within the White House, there's one term that is more exotic than any other, and it's called a do-out. And the idea is after a meeting, it's a terrible term, do out. But after a meeting, you're meet, the meeting, what are you going to do? That's the do out. So we all have a do out, don't we? That's a terrible phrase. We all have a do out. Let's reduce sludge. Exactly. Yes, thanks, Cass. Thank you so much. And I think you've already, we have lots of colleagues engaged. Um, we will take this forward and thank you and Behavioral Science Group and across the UN to do more in this space. Thank you so much for your time and um, all colleagues, thank you for joining us and see you next time, the next webinar. Bye everyone. Thanks, Kath. Thanks everybody.